Right. So I'm here with Mark Andre, Mark Antoine Godin from La Press for Eyes on the Prize, and we're just going to get to know him a little bit and talk about how he covers hockey and how he came to his career. So, uh, Mark, uh, what made you realize that you wanted to be a sports writer? Well, it's um, there, it's two passions that were that were with me for the longest time ever since I was a little boy, seven or eight years old. I've always loved to write, and I've always loved sports. So one plus one equals two. Um, I was a little kid going to school, and I would, at the time, La Presse had this uh, tabloid sports section that I would pick out of the newspaper and bring it with me to school, and I would learn all the statistics, all the uh, the, the average of pitchers in baseball or the uh, the average of goaltenders in the NHL. Everything was by heart. I was a little encyclopedia back then when I was yeah when I was a little kid. So it it stayed with me, and um, so I was always a sports fan. Um, but I I knew that I was all, also someone who could write fairly well. So. Uh, I went to university, I studied uh, literature, and when I finished my master's thesis in creative writing, I thought, okay, so I like to write, I like sports, so I'm going to write about about sports. So I came knocking at uh, La Presse's door. Uh, they didn't give me a job right away. It took uh, it took a while before it happened, but eventually I got in. So it's really um, like the, the the doors open uh, magically for me, um, and it's great because. Uh, I don't. I rarely see myself doing anything else than what I'm doing now. Uh, particularly with my male friends or just acquaintances, people say, oh, you, "You know, you're lucky to have that job." And I know I am because it's it, we're so we're so few to have it. And geez, to cover Montreal Canadiens for La Presse newspaper, and sometimes I got to pinch myself because it's a uh, it's pretty nice. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, a bit of glory kind of comes with it in in some form or another, like. It's kind of like uh, trying to figure out the word to say it, um, like a high prestige job in a way to cover the Canadians in Montreal. There is there is a pre prestige factor. There is no doubt. I, I, when I started my my career, well, I had been at La Presse for a few years, but when I started uh, being a, a reporter on a full time basis, I was covering the Expos, which was you know it's still a big deal. They were not drawing crowds anymore back then, but it was still a major league sport in town, and. Um, but not once have I felt that the, uh, the, the, the the interest for what I was writing had the impact of what I'm writing with the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, the, uh, the, the that that particular topic is uh, really uh, uh, intrigues and interests so many people that it gives you a yeah you talking about prestige or a, a power that uh, that's. Uh, that's both very uh, humbling to deal with and also it's something that you have to be careful of the way you use it because uh, people will um, rightfully uh, think that, well, if you've been given that job, it's because you're worthy of doing it. So because of that, I must make sure that I, won't, I will honor that job and not make a, a, a disgrace out of it, that, uh, that, that will, I will um, uh, continue to, uh, to maintain the credibility of my newspaper. And that uh, over time, while well, people will come to uh, to esteem the, what I'm writing, both in in in, uh, in its form and it's in uh, content. So uh, th this is something that I, I really I'm crafting little by little. Uh, but it's it's my sixth year uh, covering hockey full time this year. Well, I'm not, I'm covering more lockout than hockey this season. But hey, um, and I've changed a lot since the first year. It's all. It's funny because the more experience you get, the less inclined you are to give your opinion. Right. It's like the, the more you know, the less you know. It's exactly the same in hockey because you talk with a lot of people, they bring you new ideas and they put in perspective that the stuff that you thought you knew had, has to be, uh, uh, you know, keep the, in, uh, it has to be kept in check a little bit and you have to ask more questions that you have to provide your own answers. Absolutely. I, on your Twitter profile, it says 30% uh, English, 70% French. Right. And I, yeah, I think you make a, a very good effort to uh, engage both communities in Montreal and in Quebec. 
How difficult is it for you to balance that uh, language divide, and does it also create some different opportunities that maybe other writers that don't speak both languages from, like, say, Toronto or New York don't get? I don't think that Twitter has provided any opportunity to me, not yet. Uh, but the idea of, of having a bilingual account is the fact that, well, first I'm very comfortable in English, my wife is Anglophone, so, and, and the language of hockey, whether we like it or not, is English, that's how, that's the language we work in every day. And, uh, but mainly I thought, uh, Habs Nation is a, is a reality, it's like Red Sox Nation, there are fans of, of the Montreal Canadiens everywhere, not just in Montreal. And uh, I thought I I, uh, I give my readers uh, on La Presse on our, our website plenty of content. I still do it via Twitter. But uh, I thought the fan, the Montreal Canadiens fans from from BC or from the United States or from Europe uh, that are English-speaking people, do they have only the Gazette to be their source of information for for perhaps news? I thought, well, why why not? try to provide them with some diversity, maybe a different uh, opinion, different angle, uh, that, that's got a French twist. So uh, so that's why, I mean, and I know sometimes I get people uh, writing to me, a French reader, that say, how come, uh, since when your newspaper has become bilingual? And they're, sometimes they're teasing me, sometimes they're upset, and, and I know that on the other end of the spectrum, some Anglophones are not adding me on their Twitter list, because most of the time, well, I'll fill my timeline with French stuff, so if they, they're not interested in that, well, it might cost me some readers, but it's, it's not a race, it's not a contest, it's about uh, providing enough information. So, most of the time, I write in French, but the, the hard news, the, the, the news bit that, that I think are relevant to be given to everybody, uh, sometimes I'll just translate everything and do it in, in both languages. Yeah, I think it works out great. Uh, you found a way to draw in people from different communities and give a lot of information that everybody can understand. And I think uh, you do a great job with it. Do you have uh, a favorite sports story that you've covered so far in your career? Well, hockey-wise, I think that uh, my, uh, my most thrilling moment was uh, what we would call the Halak playoffs. Uh, those uh, those games where uh, Yaroslav Halak stood on his head uh, against Washington and the um, the roof of the building uh, exploded. I mean that was quite impressive, but very thrilling because I haven't I haven't covered the, the Stanley Cup Finals in Montreal, uh, so, so that's as far as we got. Yeah. And uh, so that 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 was pretty nice uh, because the players always say you know when when we're winning there's no better place to play than in Montreal so well when the team is winning there's no better place to write than in Montreal also um, and I'm not one of those guys that try to that like to dig in, in, in the players trash and, and write negative stories all the time I think that there are good human stories to be found on a winning team, winning team too so it's it's nice to write about positive stuff uh, as long as it's it, it's inspiring and as long as it, it, it drives people somewhere whether it's negative or positive but if, uh, if it draws an interest and it's an easy subject with, uh, with, uh, with the Canadians because it draws a lot of interest well it's uh, uh, a good situation like those playoffs uh, in 2010 they, they, they give you plenty of opportunity uh, but I've covered other sports I uh, the, the Ryder Cup, uh, I went to, I mean, I covered, I don't follow golf at all. Uh, I covered only one tournament in my life, and that was the Ryder Cup in Ireland. I can't remember in which year, but uh, well, that was a great experience too, and I always kept that with me. A uh, few World Series, uh, Kurt Schilling with the Red Sox in 2004, uh, that was pretty nice too. So those are the mo moments that really uh, stand out. Yeah. You were saying that you don't like to dig into the player, player's garbage. Do you find that uh, the rising tide of like this, these insider people kind of like makes that hard? They kind of they, they draw a bunch of viewers. Like there's uh, like the people on Twitter that report fake trades and fake rumors and all that stuff. Do you find that that's like a big detriment to the industry at all? Or? Well, it is because there's a. It depends if if your media is going to try to race against those those uh, anonymous sources everywhere. 
Um, the, the main problem I've got with those sites, those blogs, or those uh, twi fake Twitter accounts is that it's a problem of accountability. Where, whenever they're right, because sometimes, you know, okay, if we go back in the old days, before there was uh, internet or before there was Twitter, a, a, a person that had information would give his information to a reporter who would verify it and eventually sometimes print it. Right. Now the informant can be his own media. Right. So you've got someone that comes out of the blue that nobody knows, but he'll provide information. So who am I to say that because he's not part of a legitimate media outlet, he's not credible? He might be, he might have good sources. So I won't condemn all those people altogether. And sometimes they might be right on certain stories. They might be ahead of the, the, uh, the mainstream media. That's okay. But the day that they're wrong, the day that they that they, uh, they, they, they try to give an exclusive scoop and all that, and it's a bunch of bull. Yeah. Well, they don't have the accountability after that from the reader saying, hey, you were wrong. If we print stuff at La Presse that is plain wrong, and now I'm saying Patrick Roy is coming, he's the next coach of the Canadian, and it's a done deal. And if it doesn't happen, we're going to get a serious slap on the hand. So, and they don't have that sort of accountability. So yeah, we might not be the, always the first on the news, but as long as we're right, we maintain our credibility intact. So that's why there's a temptation not to, to, to stay away from those, uh, f from those uh, new uh, temptations, new... Uh, That, that, that are coming that seems to be you know growing more and more every day and the thing is there are the less trades there are the more trade rumors there are people fans are avid for trade rumors and so they'll read everything they'll take everything uh, for cash and and absorb everything have you heard you know so so many fans come to me and say have you heard the latest rumor about this uh, Uh, Suri is about to get, uh, not Suri, uh, uh, P.K. Subban is about to get traded to Philadelphia for this guy and that guy. Where did they come, to, they get that from, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's mind-boggling sometimes. But at the same time, I mean, I know that sometimes they were, they were right, so, you know, kudos to them. There's something also to be said for hard work, right? I, it's so easy to create a big following by reporting BS. Yeah. Uh, lots of people do it, and this, to be able to, it takes a lot longer to build a following. Just you know, staying to what you know and writing uh, mostly dispassionately, even though you are passionate, not taking a firm side. Like you said, asking questions. It takes longer to grow that way, but I think there's something to be said about that. And uh, you managed to stay away from a lot of the silliness that happens in Montreal, like. Uh, a lot of media and fans piggyback on running players out of town and things yeah. like that. Uh, do you find yourself, do you find that very easy to do or has it ever been a conflict that you wanted to really jump in and share your opinion on something but you had to like pull yourself back and kind of rein it in? Well, I haven't been afraid to give my opinion so I didn't pull back really but um, whoever spends enough time in Montreal, where whether it's a coach or a player, realizes that there are two types of media, at least two types of media in Montreal. There are those that follow the team, that are uh, that, that go to practice, go to the games, talk to the players, and those that stay, uh, uh, you know, that, that stay away, uh, that are, you know, on TV shows, or on the radio, and the, mo the, the people that, that stir the most trouble are often those that we never see at the game. So my, my, my motto has been, whatever I say in public or I write, I should be able to say it face to face to a player. And part of my, I was talking about accountability before, well, the same goes towards the players. If I write something, I, I need to be able to back it up the following day when I get to the, when I enter the locker room and I go talk to players. So, you know, some, And, and now defunct uh, radio station used to have a lot of those big mouths that were uh, really contributing to the, to the, uh, kicking players out of town uh, by you know stirring trouble and all that. But you would rarely see them talking with, with players. So uh, Saku Koivu once told me he said, "Yeah, the, the, there's a there's a almost a mathematical equation to be made between your your." your distance to the locker room and 
the amount of BS that you'll be able to say or to write. So he was he was right about that. So my position, my my job asks me to be in constant uh, contact with the player, so the the issue resolves by yeah. itself. Do you uh, travel with the players to, on the road? Yes, I yeah. do. I, we, uh, on the, the way we work at La Presse is that we are two guys that are uh, covering the beat, Richard Labbé and I. So the, both of us, we cover the 82 games and we split the 41 games on the road uh, into... We, when, before season starts, we look at the calendar and whatever it works best to uh, uh, to, uh, to both of us, well, we divide the, the, the calendar accordingly. And uh, so we have roughly the same number of, of road games. And uh, But we fly commercial, you know, we're not following the team on their charter. Uh, the only member, members of the media that follow the team uh, in the charter are broadcasters play-by-play. -play. So guys from uh, from, uh, from TSN Radio and, and uh, 98.5, you know, the play-by-play -play guys, and uh, and the two from RDS. But otherwise, all the beat reporters, they fly commercial. What are your impressions of the current makeup of the team? Do you see anything glaring weaknesses? Do you think if this season actually happens that they'll get anywhere, or do you think it's kind of another year where we're hoping for a good draft? Well, I think that... I don't think that that team was as bad as his draft ranking was last year. Uh, it was obviously not a team good enough to make the playoffs, but it's not its not a team that, that was worthy of finishing that last in the East. It ended up being that for a number of reasons, including injuries. I don't expect the makeup of the team, what I mean by that is that the, the key players have not changed from last year, so I don't expect dramatically improved results. Uh, what I expect though is that uh, under Coach Terrier, uh, his methods and the, the, the way he he, ha he asks a lot about uh, he asks a lot to his players and uh, he'll get the most out of them. So on the short term, there's going to be a Michel Terrien effect on the Canadians, and he's going to be able to take the maximum out of that group of players. How long it's going to last? It might last a year, a year and a half before it starts fading. And I expect the same thing with Bob Hartley in Calgary. So I'm sure, just because it's Terrien, that the team won't finish last uh, for another year. Uh, under the, 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 the present makeup of the team, I don't expect them really to... They're, they're surely not a, a safe spot uh, in the playoffs waiting for them. But they'll battle. They'll be there. You know, they could they could finish anywhere between seven and twelve. Uh, it's so close these days. And if you know a shortened season uh, with a smaller calendar, it's going to be even closer if if if, if it really can be. Um, but honestly, the Montreal Canadiens are a team that could benefit from not having a season at all because it's. It's a season of in-between that could easily be wasted from a management standpoint and it would not have a serious impact. The, the real impact is financially from Jeff Molson, but that's a whole different story. Hockey-wise, when you look at the core of this team, uh, what's most important is their, their, their prospects need to gain experience. They're doing it, they're learning the hard way in, in Hamilton. But I think that we'll start to see a shift uh, maybe in a couple of years from now and the Canadians could fairly rapidly return to respectability and become contenders if you know two or three of those prospects pan out uh, I, I think that each in their own style we can we can think that Dolchenyak and Tenorti will be locks to become like uh, important players on the Canadians at some point you know uh, Tenorti never an offensive weapon of course but as a steady guy um, at the blue line uh, Nathan Beaulieu we don't know uh, Bonival I like what I, I like his grip. I, I like him a lot yeah I, I think he's very underrated yeah he's uh, I think he could be a good third line sentiment he, he reminds me a little bit of uh, hockey wise of uh, Christopher Higgins when he arrived you know in terms of his intensity uh, so they, they've, got, they've got tools, they, they might not, apart from Galchenia, no budding superstar in the way, uh, but they've got a franchise goaltender, 
Uh, they've got a young defenseman that, that, that might pan out to become a star too. Uh, and they'll have, but of course up front they'll have to solve their problem. It's for the longest time we've said that the, their problem in Montreal Canadiens were at center. But what we noticed last year is that with uh, Dearnet, Prokanets, and Eller, they had three potential second line center, but they barely had uh, enough uh, wingers to complement all those guys. So apart from Gianta, Cole, and Pacioretty, you know you're you you you're, uh, rapidly you get uh, you get short uh, in terms of wings. So that's a problem that will need to be addressed. But apart from the prospects, I guess that it's only when uh, a certain amount of money will be freed and that, that, that Marc Benjamin will be able to use it, that we'll see how he, he can compensate and really uh, strengthen the system. Uh, which uh, Habs team, I think you said you were covering since 2007, yeah. of those teams, which team was your favorite makeup to, to cover? Was it the 2010 team just because of the playoffs, or maybe the 08 team because they were first in the conference? Or? Uh, I, don't, I think that it doesn't really change from one year to another. Uh, you never know. Yeah, you never know really what you get into, and, but ex apart from the, the shift from 2009 to 2010 where the complete roster changed, it's, it's the same faces year after year, so are they uh, nicer to, to cover one year or more than another? It, it doesn't really change. The only, the only year that stands out compared to the other is the centennial season, because for all the effort that management has done to uh, to create fireworks and, and a year of celebration. It was a total meltdown on the ice and in the yeah. locker room. So it was like one scandal after another. It was endless. Um, so so that was really something else to cover that year. But apart from that, I mean, the amount of, you know, the number of wins, losses, how far they go in the playoffs, it, it's, it doesn't change anything to my job. So it's, uh, I get it. I tend to get a bit of distance towards their performances, so it it just gives me a direction on the the, the topics I might uh, write about the day after. Um, but I don't. I I'm insensitive now to, uh, to to wins and losses. Outside of the Halak playoffs, was there ever a time where you were genuinely surprised at what was going on with the team on the ice, or? Uh, what do you mean by that? They generally, well, I was, I was, I was surprised how low they could get last year. Last year, yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think that uh, Pierre Gauthier is the one person that surprised me the most since I covered. Uh, I started covering hockey because of the type of decision he made, because of the timing of his decisions. He he, he left everybody wondering, including his own players, and to this day. It's, it just baffles me how, <laughs> how this guy manages his team. I mean, um, you know, we, we we have to think, of course, everybody knows about Kemal being traded between second and third period. There's Pasek not knowing where he was going, or the same with Hal Gill. Uh, the firing of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Terry Pern an hour and a half before a game. Right. Replacing a coach with a guy who who kept pretty much the same system as his predecessor, so the players were left, you know, they, they thought, well, how come he got rid of the, of the other coach if he's to replace him with someone who's got exactly the same philosophy? I always thought, well, if you decide to make a change because you think that the option that you've got in the, waiting in the wing become, becomes a better option than the current one. In this case, there was no way, and I'll, with all due respect to Randy Conworth, I mean, he was, he was a very good guy, and he, was, he had a tough hand to play. Um, but he was he was just not a better coach as Jacques Martin yeah. so I thought personally that uh, that uh, Gauthier would have waited until the season was over to, 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 to sack uh, Martin but he thought well if if I wait until the end of the season it's not only Martin is going to get fired but me yeah. too well in the end he was right yeah. he was right I think that's probably all I got to ask you really okay. you that's good anything else um, thanks for doing this, Mark. No problem. Uh, I really appreciate it. It was really great to meet you. Yeah, absolutely. Um,